You got that? I need to be in the pulpit so I can say, you hear that? Really bang on it. Why do I keep getting these ones, Pastor Alice? What do you think? It's just luck of the draw, I think. It's wild. Uh, But I will say this, as director of discipleship here at Good Shepherd Lutheran Church, you may notice I am regularly talking about that work of discipleship, talking about the best ways that we can exemplify uh, Jesus' character. I talk about his ways, his words, his works. Because discipleship is, in essence, imitating our teacher. That's what it means. It is best that you be like your teacher, is exactly how it means, how it's described as being a disciple. In short, I want to be like Jesus. Anyone here? Show of hands. Who wants to be like Jesus? Good. You should all have them up. That's why we're here. That's it. We're trying to learn about Jesus. Right. Okay. So, Jesus is great. Don't get me wrong. But this is one of those ones where I go, do I want to be like Jesus? Do I really want to be like him? Because here, here's what happens. Jesus has a great big crowd following him. That's how it starts. A great big crowd is following him. They want to hear more from him. They want to see some of those cool razzle-dazzle miracles. They want to see him multiply fish. They want to see him turn like water into wine, raise somebody from the dead. Why not? Let's see this guy. He's amazing. They're all following him. And then Jesus turns around to this great crowd and preaches a purposefully divisive message. On purpose, a message to a crowd that says, hey, hate your mom, hate your dad, hate your kids. If you don't want to, don't even start. Don't even start following me. You know what? Don't even like your children. Don't try to follow me any further unless you're ready to take up a cross. We hear cross and we think this. I want you to think, if he, listen to this. Hey, y'all, you don't want to follow me unless you want to sit and ride the electric chair with me right metal it sounds so intense who is going to follow this jesus this is a challenging one bud that is not how you keep a crowd (laughs) you don't do that to them great news everybody i got a lot of awful things for you to do no but that's where jesus differs from me it seems jesus has no interest in the crowd itself in fact every time he has a crowd it seems he does something to get away from it ducks into a small house where they can't fit or he goes to a quiet place to pray, and the disciples are like, Where is it? it's showtime, Jesus. Where are you? He's off somewhere praying quietly. Or, Jesus, we've got a great big crowd. He's getting in a boat. Why is he getting in a boat? He's crossing the sea. All right. He keeps running away from them. He's, he, there's something about this guy that is repelled by the crowd, but what he isn't repelled by is the good news. That is consistent. He is repeatedly talking about that he's about the good news really good news and the good news sometimes isn't good news for everybody as they hear it um you'll hear it when he uh, comes to somebody who is afflicted with demons right they're possessed they go go away jesus i don't want to hear any of what you have to say or he goes to that i uh, remember the young rich man right he says oh jesus you're great i want to hear more about your good news he goes great news it's great news really and you should sell all your possessions and give it to the poor and he's like no that's a little too hard he'll come up to people in power he'll challenge them to let go of that he'll challenge them to lift up the lowly he'll challenge them to level these things and i will ask has anybody i'm sure i'm not alone we've all heard teachings from jesus we're like that's a little far gay man that's a little tough I don't want the message sometimes that Jesus preaches that is very divisive. I don't want a message that's impractical. I don't want something that so many people will just say, hard pass, not my speed. Not into that kind of thing. Because in truth, what I want is a crowd. I'm a Labrador. I love heaps of people. There's heaps of people. My tail's wagging. If I had one, it'd going nuts i just love it i want all these heads together sharing um our passion sharing our our ideas for how we can better serve the kingdom i want a crowd but if i'm being real honest what i want is to be in more control of the message i want to be in more control i want to have more authority i want the approval of the crowd oh that feels good when y'all chuckle at me i'm like i love it i love it I just do. I want the good news, but I want it on my terms. I want it the way I want to say it, like the rich young man who asks, how do you follow Jesus? Well, put down your stuff and pick up mine. Eh, My stuff I like. 
This reading does that to me. It calls me to the carpet and causes me to ask myself, Alex, do you want to follow Jesus? Do you want to imitate Jesus in his ways? Not just his words. You know his words, Alex. Not just his works. You know his works. But his ways. Do you want to do this? Better question. What are you willing to let go of in order to do that? What are you willing to sacrifice in order to follow Jesus more closely? I'm thinking of the first reading. I lay before you life and death, curses and blessings. Choose life. That's what I like about this faith. There's a freedom in it. There is a great freedom in faith. And as much as I want the crowd, Jesus is always offering this choice. Are you going to follow me or are you going to follow the crowd? Are you going to follow something else? Because we know the other story. I think we know the story of the crowd. I think we know the story of the world. It's about um, risk aversion. It's about playing it safe. It's about resource accumulation. It's about the pursuit of wealth. It's a game. It's win the game by getting all the stuff. Making sure you keep the stuff. We know the dangers of that though, right? That's obvious. We should know. We know the illness we can experience with want. We know how quickly money and possessions can flee from us, how we can end up being even owned by our possessions. Anyone here own a storage unit? It costs. It costs to have stuff, doesn't it? Yes. But think of the other things we're owned by, truly. Um, think of the ways that maybe our work life, our professional life, keeps us from pursuing matters of the Spirit. Anyone ever say to themselves, sure, I'd like to volunteer more or serve in this capacity? Sure, I would like to pray more or something or read the Bible or, you know, do better. But uh, the schedule just doesn't permit it. I have a small group and we regularly talk about how hard it is sometimes to incorporate our faith into daily life because of all the challenges that can bring from career, life, expectations. It's hard. But there is a choice. There's always a choice. And the choice is often and repeatedly, what are you willing to let go of? Jesus uses the word hate. Pretty powerful stuff. But what are you willing to forsake, to put aside for the good news? What are you willing to put down in order to pick something else that is more like Jesus? For me, it's, Alex, are you willing to forsake the laughter, the joy, the approval of a crowd? Are you willing to let go of uh, this desire for something more comfortable, controlled, something that feels more natural to you in order to go deeper? to get more personal with people. Labradors aren't known for sharing their feelings a lot. Just the tail. Yeah. Um, for you, it may be, uh, what are you willing to put down in terms of maybe your own sense of esteem and accomplishment? Your expectations you hold for yourself, that you are an excellent individual who does great things and only great things, so I'm not going to do those things I'm not that good at. Are you willing to let go of your schedule in order to make time for matters of the spirit? Are you willing to let go of your own sense of control, confidence, comfort, step into that next level of obedience to God? Because I can think of one way, this is, here I am betraying my bias here, one way we are called to be faithful that stresses a ton of people out. You've heard this sermon before. I'm going to tell you about it. Okay. We know our job is to be sharers um, of the faith. We possess this faith and we are called to share it with others. Um, whenever we get at this little baptismal fun over here, you guys say this thing. I don't know if you guys have read the words we're saying, but you have agreed to it. I've heard you say it a bunch of times. We are going to share this faith with children, with um, the parents. We're going to support them, support them in their walk of faith. We know this. I wonder how many of you, I'm going to do a show of hands again. How many of you feel really confident in your ability to teach the faith to children? Oh, bam, I see a few. I see a few. It's a, it's a challenging thing. It's intimidating, right? But we know we're supposed to, right? But we have these feelings of inadequacy that we're ill-equipped, and that brings us anxiety that there's not enough. We can't meet the challenge. Um, and in truth, great news, that's actually not what you agreed to in baptism. It wasn't to know all the stuff and share all the stuff. It was to support them. And support is literally 90, 95% showing up. 
If you're worried about the other percent, Jen Jarman and I can sort you out with that. We got activities, lessons, resources. Guys, we got closets full of stuff. We can help you do that. We have ways that we can in, enhance this choice you have of investing your time, your talent, yourselves with the work of sharing the good news. And I'll say, it's not just about sharing alongside kids. It's serving in worship. It's serving at God's Work Our Hands events we have next week. It's serving for Habitat, who here feels really confident in their ability to build a house. Great news. They have people on site that'll teach you how to do that. We got to be willing to take that risk and do that thing. If you've ever thought about doing a Habitat build, I don't know if that's my thing. It is. I promise. You'll love it. Give it a shot. Why not? What can you put down in order to pick up something that is undeniably good? Housing those who need homes. I bring up the faith formation thing, though, the kids' education piece, because in our recent survey, people lifted up repeatedly a desire to see more children involved at Good Shepherd Lutheran Church. In our programming, and people lamented seeing fewer kids, especially during COVID, seeing fewer children pre-COVID even. You're not wrong, there are less. But again, thankfully, it's not about a crowd. It's about the work. It's about the good news because it is a good and noble thing that we do. How are we taking part in it? How are each and every one of us who value that thing of sharing the faith, putting ourselves into that work, putting down something to offer ourselves? I mean, if that is truly a value of ours, we must show it. We need to invest our time, our talents, our very selves in the formation of one another. Share with them why it's important. Share with our neighbors why Learning this life of faith is so important, especially when raising kids, when the world's narrative continues to tell you they need to do absolutely every single extracurricular activity possible. Your schedule needs to be packed or you're doing a bad job. How do we tell them a different story? What about the fruits of this life of faith, the works and blessings of community, the life of discipleship? In two weeks, we kick off another year of faith formation. Myself and Jen Jarman, we are always on the lookout for people who are willing to serve alongside our youngest disciples. And I'll say it, just like VBS. You guys remember this series of sermons I did before VBS? We need it. We need people involved. We need mentors. We need shepherds. We need people who are willing to show up and say, I care about you, little one. I care about your faith. And I hope just like at VBS, and this happened, we get an outpouring of support and shepherds and mentors and servants because if you notice, our VBS program doesn't seem to shrink. It's always packed. I think it has a lot to do with we always got people serving. We put on this great thing. We have so many servants who are ready to bless. If we have a vibrant faith formation program, if we want that, we have a choice, do or don't. We can submit to our insecurities, submit to our schedules, or we can boldly pursue God's will and ask, what might I need to put down in order to invest in this meaningful thing? The formation of the body of Christ and truly any of our transformative ministries. It doesn't have to be just that. What are you being called to put down in order to pick up something undeniably good? Because the good news is the point. It always has been. But here's the thing. Magical thing that happens about prioritizing the good news. When the good news becomes the point. When discipleship becomes the priority. When sharing the faith with Children, outsiders, neighbors, enemies, family, co-workers, when practicing the good work of serving and sharing is the point of this whole endeavor, as demonstrated by Jesus Christ, a funny thing happens. No matter how many times Jesus sends that crowd away, what happens? They come back. They always come back. They always come back despite the challenging word, the, uh, the good news seems to repeatedly cause people to gather again and again and again. And it's really funny how that works, but maybe it's not funny at all. Maybe we should start to expect it and prioritize that good news. And for that, I say, thanks be to God for that promise. Thanks be to God for the effect the good news has on all people. For the good news, we have the ability to share. For the hearts, for the minds, the passions, the talents that exist in this room to be clear reflections of God's life, light, hope, mercy, peace, forgiveness, hospitality, welcoming. I could keep going, folks, because that's how many gifts we have here. Thanks be to God for that. Thanks be to God for our willingness to share it. Amen.